Hi everyone, my name is Mustafa. I'm a staff product designer at Twitter. I've been a digital designer for 20 years and previous to this I was working on Google Chrome. Uh, the topic of my talk is hacking user perception, so hopefully you enjoy it. So let's get on with the show. So the topic of my talk is hacking user perception. It's broken down to a couple of parts. First, I'm going to tell some stories which conceptually explain what I mean by hacking user perception. Then I'm going to go through some technical examples of hacking for speed, hacking for friction, and also looking at navigation. So the first story I'd like to tell is about McDonald's milkshakes. And the idea is about understanding your users' needs. So McDonald's had a pain point. They wanted to increase the sales of their milkshakes. And the way they thought about understanding what customers actually wanted was running a series of focus groups. So obviously when you sit down with a group of people and you ask them, what, do you, what would make a really great milkshake? They would say, well, make it sweeter, make it colder, make it thicker, make it larger. Uh, and this is one of the dangers of running focus groups. When you ask users, what do you want? Oftentimes they'll just guess an answer because they want to give some sort of answer or affirmation. And so when McDonald's took this approach and they improved the recipe of the milkshakes, um, sales remained the same because they didn't get to the main point of what users were actually using a milkshake for. And so what they did was they reframed the methods of discovery. Uh, and to do this, they ran an ethnographic study. So the methodology, cha methodology changed. The original methodology was running a focus group. Now they're actually observing the users at a McDonald's. And so for 18 hours a day, they would sit inside of a McDonald's and watch people buy milkshakes. What they discovered was that most people, about 50% of the shakes sold, were sold before 8 a.m. in the morning. And most of the customers buying the milkshakes were doing it by themselves. Now this really surprised us, this behavior, because if you were to think about it, the idea of buying a milkshake, uh, you would think in a, on a summer's day, lunchtime in the evening, but 50% were sold in the morning. And so they went a second day, again, observing the users, but this time standing outside of the restaurant. And when they asked them, like, what are you actually doing? Why are you buying a milkshake at this time of the morning? What they discovered was that people were basically treating the milkshake like a breakfast. They were hiring the milkshake to do a specific task. Because in, say, America, a commute to work takes about an hour. And so in that time, they have to keep their minds occupied, they want to keep engaged, and when they get to work, they want to not be hungry. So one of the participants said they ate a banana, but by the time they got to work, they were hungry before lunch. And so by hiring this milkshake, consuming it for the duration of their journey to work, they were full by the time they got to work, and they stayed full until lunchtime. And so when you think about understanding your user, why were they buying the milkshake? It wasn't as a drink. It was a competitor to breakfast, snacks, bananas, biscuits, stuff like that. So it's an interesting take. And once McDonald's understood what their users were trying to accomplish, they moved the milkshake machines to the front, getting customers in and out quicker, and they increased sales by 7x. And so without touching the formula of the milkshake, they were able to actually improve their sales. And now you know McDonald's, they do breakfast shakes and things like that. This all comes from like this study. And so once you understand your user, coming up with a solution to what they're trying to accomplish becomes that much easier. The second story is about occupied time versus unoccupied time. It's a story of Houston Airport. And so Houston Airport in America, in Texas, had a high level of complaints. Passengers would complain about how long it would take for their suitcases to get from the airplane to the terminal building. And so Houston Airport spent millions optimizing this process. Uh, they hired more people, they employed more tech, and they got the time it took from the suitcases to go from the airplane all the way to the terminal to seven minutes, which was very fast. Then they ran another survey to find out if the user's uh, experience had improved, but people still complained. And so what they did was, again, reframe the problem. It wasn't that the time it took for the suitcases to get to the terminal building was long. Seven minutes is the most optimum that you can get it realistically. It's just the waiting is annoying. When people are traveling, they're very stressed. And when they're stressed, things seem much slower. 
And so the goal is to make the weight feel shorter. And so they had the observation where they looked that the planes would park very close to the terminal building. And so when they parked the planes further away, complaints uh, dropped to zero. So basically they made people walk further to make the waiting time for the suitcases feel shorter. So in the beginning, people walk for two minutes and then they wait for five minutes versus people walking for five minutes and then waiting for two minutes. And then from that, complaints dropped. So again, understanding that uh, when you're hacking people's uh, perception, uh, you have to think about what is realistic and uh, to meet some of their expectations as well. Another story, legacy systems. And this is one about the slow elevator. Now, people in buildings complain that the elevator is always too slow and building managers have to deal with these problems. Uh, the solution is make the elevator go faster. And you can do that by installing new lifts, upgrading motors, create new algorithms. But the problem with this is it's not feasible. So a lot of websites suffer this problem. They're like legacy systems and you can't just rip out old code and put in new stuff. It's very expensive just to change like that. And so when they're looking at the pain point and reframing the problem, it's not that the elevator itself is necessarily slow. It's that the waiting is annoying and frustrating. And so instead of ripping out the old elevators and putting in new ones, you say, okay, how can we make the waiting feel shorter? And so you say, okay, building managers will put up mirrors, they'll play music, and they'll install the hand sanitizer, again, to distract uh, people in the building long enough for the elevator to arrive, and then magically it feels faster. So again, I'm gonna give some technical examples of how we can actually do this in digital design. But again, I want you to think about this conceptually. The last story before we get into some of those examples is the concept of passing on complexity to the user, and it's a story of search. And so, way back in the 90s, finding stuff on the web was very difficult. Like, we couldn't come up with a very good classification system of what a good search result is and what a bad search result is. And so, because of that, we added a lot of choice, and you can see from the UI in the background. And so, we don't know what a good thing is, so we add input field, fine, categorize widgets, and feature widgets, or categorize links, rather, and feature widgets. And so, because we can't figure out what a good search result is, we give all these options and we pass on that complexity to the user. We don't know what you're looking for, but here's a list of everything that you could possibly look for. And this is quite bad. This meant searching on the web was really difficult. And so, again, reframing the problem. Finding stuff on the web is hard, but finding the wrong content is actually the thing that's frustrating. And so how do we solve this very complex problem? Well, you come up with, um, you make the content easier to find by coming up with a better classification system. So in science and academia, uh, you have citations. If a paper is cited lots of times, then it's considered a good paper. If it has a lower number of citations, it's considered a bad, generally speaking. Um, so when you replace citation with web links, the founders of Google, um, Larry and Sergey, what they did was they had the page rank algorithm, which looked at primarily how many, page, how many links a page had. And that was the basis of what was considered a good link. So once you have a good classification system, you can have a simple UI. One input field, one text field, and two buttons, and that's it. You go from what we had before to what we have now. And so when you solve, the, so instead of passing on the complexity to the user, you're solving the complexity for the user. So you make it easier. These are hard problems to solve, but when done right, you can make amazing experiences. And so in this, we have slow, low friction. This is where you don't want to be. When the system is slow and there's nothing um, distracting or occupying the user's time. Then you have slow, high friction. So the system is slow, but you're actually doing things to distract the user to make it feel faster. We have fast, high friction where you've optimized to the best possible means, but you still need to add friction points to make sure that the user's expectation is met. And then fast, low friction where the system is so fast, you don't need to actually stop the user from doing anything. And so all of our examples started here 
when there was no friction and they're really slow. And then piece by piece, we actually get around. So again, we never changed anything from an engineering standpoint, but we added some friction points, which made the elevator feel faster. Again, for Houston and McDonald's, they were as fast, they improved the actual speed, and then it was actually looking at how you can introduce friction, and finally search, where, where this is the ideal place you want to be, but it's very difficult to get to, like from a technical standpoint, because there's a point where you can't optimize anymore. And so when we're thinking about speed, they're broken down into two pieces, the real and the perceived. And so here's an example of uh, technical speed. So we have the newspaper in the UK called the Financial Times. Now the Financial Times uh, is a subscription website that's very expensive. And for that reason, they don't have a large amount of budget that they can target every single user. So what they do is they analyze whether a user is worth track is worth targeting or not. And so they've discovered that if a user comes to the website and reads five articles a month, they're likely to be interested. And if they can get those users to nine articles a month, then the likelihood of them subscribing increased dramatically. And so they called this the tipping point. So they wanted to go from push those users from five articles to nine articles. But what they found by making the site one second faster, they actually increased engagement for everybody by 5%. So even users that they were not targeting benefited from this technical speed and technical improvements. So by reducing the, the size of images, by minifying code, things of that nature. And what we, when I was working at Google uh, last year, when we did like, Google used to do a lot of studies around uh, speed and user perception to speed and loading times. And we found that 51% of users said that they would not make a purchase on a mobile site if it loaded slowly. So technical speed is very important and very critical to an experience. And when you look at the UX hierarchy of importance, how long a page takes to load is always considered the most important thing for users. When you look at how this, the next free, how easy it is to find what I'm looking for, this is about perception. How can I quickly find the information hierarchy? How well a site fits on my screen? Is, it, is everything immediate? And how simple is the site to use? All these things are perceptive things that we can use to improve. How attractive the site looks is much ranked towards the bottom. Now, branding of a site is really critical and important. Um, so I'm not knocking like the visual style but when you ask user in terms of priority, speed and how long a page takes to load is the most priority. And so what can we do? There's some quick wins. So a quick wing is optimizing images. Like images make up a large portion of many web pages. As a matter of fact, 52%, according to HTTP archive, the weight of a page or the average page uh, web page content is made up of images. So one small thing that we can do uh, that will have a significant impact on technical speed is reducing image size. And so some of my former colleagues I worked with at Google, we created an app called Squoosh, which is a progressive web app. And let me just do a quick demo for you. So if we go into Squoosh, this is Squoosh, if we go to squoosh.app, um, you can drag and drop images, it'll work on mobile as well. Uh, but for the case of this, I'm actually gonna give you some demo images. So if we take this image here, we just wait for it to load. So what you see on the left is the actual original image, and that's uh, 2.79 megabytes. And here we have codecs that we can actually manipulate. So for example, MozJPEG. If I increase the, the bar here, you actually see it calculating. So we see an increase of 2%. That's not good. So if we decrease the actual quality, you'll see it, uh, size has actually dropped by 91%. And if you can actually zoom in and make a comparison of this. So you think, okay, this is a bit too pixely. How about we actually move it up? And you can see that. But obviously, the realis realistically, the image will be this size. And then you can download this. So we've dropped the file size by 87%. A simple thing to do. And so designers, whenever working with engineers, please optimize your images. It will help them a lot. And we demoed this at Google I.O. Uh, sorry, we demoed this at, at the, the I.O. website at Chrome Dev Summit 2018. And we, we reduced the main header images by 83%. Uh, and there was hardly any difference could be noticed or seen. And so it's a, even Google themselves could actually do more of this to improve 
the overall technical experience and speed of a site. It's now speed matters on the mobile web, but the perception of speed is just as important. So we've looked at technical speed. Now let's look at the perceptive speed. Because if you remember Houston Airport, occupy time versus unoccupied time. So you want to make sure that we're distracting the users. Because interestingly, sites which are considered to be technically fast, a third of users, 32%, perceive them to have not loaded fast. So even when you've done a lot of technical optimization, users may still complain. And so, okay, what can we actually do to improve this? And a lot of this is about how perception and navigation. And so there's a, a deep philosophical question you can ask yourself is, is like, what makes something interactive? Like you need to ask yourself this, how does a person know to click a button? And so like buttons and navigation items should always look inviting. So in the physical world, in elevators, for example, you have these physical buttons which uh, are clearly labeled and clearly marked um, just by their 3D nature that they can be pressed, clicked or whatever. And so if we look at affordances, it's really critical in the digital world. And so doing stuff like this, like text buttons, which are not clear to the user what they do, is really bad. And according to a study by UX Movement, they demonstrated that these navigation items like this actually perform really badly, as opposed to navigation items which are really obvious and really clear. So if you want a user to click on a button, you make it as obvious as possible. Functions of navigation and interaction items should be clear. Like so, when a user sees something and presses it, it should be ideally should they should have an idea of what will happen as a result. And so, a few years ago, a Japanese user was looking at Excel, and they saw the save icon, and they asked an interesting question. They said, "Why is the save icon a vending machine?" You see, one of the challenges with iconography without labels. Um, is iconography can change metaphors over time. So if, if you look at, if you've never seen a floppy disk before, it looks like that. And so they'll make a direct translation. This is why labeling on icons is really important. And when you do navigation, not relying solely on iconography as the, the key affordance for users, make everything very clear to the user. Like Microsoft also discovered this, that with the exception of the delete button, uh, icon menus that didn't have any labels were not interacted with them. And soon as Microsoft added labels, engagement increased for all of their features. And so like having iconography is really critical. Now, when I was working on this uh, talk, my daughter asked me, saw me having like these different icons on the screen. And she said, when she saw the save icon, she said, Baba, are you a detective? You see, it hadn't occurred to me that in the UK, kids, when they see a magnifying glass, they think of Sherlock Holmes, and they think of a detective. And so they're indoctrinated culturally that looking for things, searching is all about being a detective. Interestingly, when the search icon was shown in India, amongst the villages and rural area by Amazon, they said, why is the search icon a ping pong paddle? So they saw this as a ping pong racket, like a tennis racket. And so you have to understand that culturally shapes and images uh, can be interpreted in many different ways. And so relying solely on iconography is very risky. Always use a label where possible, unless the symbol is so super obvious. But even then, uh, culturally, things can change. Another thing we have to be careful of is hidden user experiences. So in iOS, you're trying to select a piece of text, it becomes very difficult. This is actually the wrong way to do it. What you're supposed to do is hold down the space bar and the whole keypad becomes a trackpad and you can move the cursor around really easily. Now, when I show this to people, they take out their phones because it's this unbelievable moment. Now, this is quite bad. Users shouldn't have to search for these things. They should be much more intuitive. Interestingly, like also on iOS, when you tap different icons, you can actually group them and move them around. Again, this is on the border of hidden versus delight experiences. So. If this is a critical part of your experience and a critical part of your acquisition of users or like sales, hiding things is really bad. But alternatively, you have delightful UX. Now, these are things which you might hide from the user, but when they discover them, there's this moment of amazement and delight. So Apple have this thing called the back tap. And so you can configure the icon 
that sits on the back of an iPhone to do an action. I think from iPhone 8 and upwards, it's called backed up and you can configure it to whatever. Now this is a delightful moment. So hiding UX experiences which provide some form of delight is fine. It's just, if, it's this, if this is a critical part of your user experience, you have to be very careful. Whenever doing any kind of interactive element, you always have to make sure that you're giving visual reassurances and feedback. So for example, a user sees a button, a user taps a button, and now the user waits because there's no uh, feedback mechanism. And so they start getting angry. What happened? And then they press the button again because maybe they didn't press it right the first time. And so in many systems, when you do that, it resets the whole process all over again. So really you want to give visual affordances that yes, we've accepted your interaction. Yes, this button has been pressed. And so like in material design, they have the thing called the ripple. So you see there's a physical thing. Sometimes a phone will vibrate. Sometimes a sound will appear. These are like the, f the physical affordances, which are really critical. Change blindness. Now this is change blindness is when there is a glitch in an image which you, it happens so quickly that you can't see the actual change. And so if you look at this image, something is changing. Let's see if you can actually notice it. For those who didn't, you can see the plane engines change with every single glitch. Another example is like visual glitches. So you can see another one here happening here. And so every time um, there is a glitch in the image, it changes. And for those of you who don't know it, the minaret is actually being removed and taken away. And so whenever doing a change from one state to another, you have to be really careful that you're not causing this change of blindness. So for example, if someone taps on add shortlist previously on um, Google, it adds it to here to the shortlist of hotels, but it happens so quickly that users will tap it again, remove the item and add it. And because this is the change of blindness, like we need to create an affordance to demonstrate that something has actually happened. And so what Google did is when you tap, it animates to avoid the change of blindness. So you're educating the user that the item has been moved and it's saved. So we're moving on to friction or like blocking the user and designing for delays. And so what's interesting about say progress bars is users generally think that the progress bar here, because of the way the animation is happening, appears to be loading 11% faster, even though they are loading the same degree. Because the way the ripples happen when things are happening really, really quickly and flashing, it gives the illusion that things are actually animating much more quicker. Interestingly, also staggering in anima animation, so slowly building up and then suddenly sp and then speeding up, actually makes uh, transitions and motions feel faster. And likewise, doing this kind of distraction or like small, really delightful animation could actually distract the user when actually doing, when you're waiting for the service or system to actually update. So for example, if someone's buying something, you might want to try and do this animation when the credit card payment's been taken. And so this is like the elevator story, the hand sanitizer, the mirror. You're doing something to distract them while the system is loading. Another example is YouTube. This progress bar you see at the top, this is fake. What YouTube does is it animates the progress bar and then waits to the end where it pretends to hang and slow down until the whole page loads because it gives the illusion that the site is coming along. Another example is Facebook. Now, many years ago, there's this story that Facebook were experimenting with uh, loading preloaders and load spinners. And what they found is when users saw this loading, they blamed Facebook the app. But when they actually changed the loading to the iOS one, they blamed the system. So instead of saying that the problem was with Facebook, they said the problem is with the actual phone itself. And so they're forgiving. Now this is quite unethical. I don't recommend anyone doing this, um, but it's something interesting about a user's perception just by changing the loader where users place the blame on the system, whether who is slow and who is fast. Now, I've done some research in loading screens. So this is basically the summary of that research. So what you don't want to do when you're loading stuff is have a blank screen. This is the worst possible thing because a user has no indication of what is actually happening. 
from that spinners now spinners are better than a blank screen the problem with spinners is it doesn't give a user any kind of indication of how long something is actually coming along so you want to try and avoid that as much as possible uh, skeleton screens are popular but conceptually it's very similar to a spinner because the user waits 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 and then suddenly all the content comes in one go ideally what you want to do is stagger the animation loading text as soon as you have it use frosted images and replace them as soon as you possibly can but more importantly is have metadata so if you see in this example the metadata is actually demonstrating showing the user that something is coming along and as soon as there's content you replace the metadata with the real thing so this again is all about reassuring the user that something is coming um, but again you have to think about it conceptually so this is YouTube and so the heaviest thing on the page is the video and so you would think that you would load the small things first but the most important part of the experience is the video so when things slow down YouTube will just make everything a great uh, skeleton screen block it and just load the video because this is the critical thing for the user right, but you also have to understand users behavior so there's many of these examples I've given but you have to adapt and so you know this is your perfect design and these are your users so with this examples I've given you have to adapt to whatever the experience you're trying to create and so for example with Google Photos like the way they load is you'd see the first bunch of images at the top as uh, the page is loaded it will start to preload other images because what Google Photos discovered that as soon as a user opens their app they start scrolling right away and then what they do is at the bottom is they start preloading really low res images so if a user gets to this part by scrolling they still see something rather than nothing you want to avoid blank screens at all costs but like what they experimented with is browsers typically will partially blur images like this which looks kind of horrible what they try to do is blur all of the images like this using um, CSS style filters but what they found was this had a performance hit because by adding a CSS filter to like hundreds of images made the thing really slow so instead what they did is they asked the browser to default uh, the image rendering to pixelated because they thought this looked visually better than um, these alternatives which this was slow and this looked a bit um, terrible but then interestingly enough what they would do is when a user taps on an image they'll blur it and then do an image swap because obviously something pixelated like this will look won't look great really large so you blur the image so again two different techniques for doing uh, essentially the same thing so again you can you like to take some of these examples treat it like a plate of food treat it like what works for you um, and then discard the rest because distracting users is really critical now this is the final example Travago what they found was when this app went offline their web app if by showing this game that said listen we're about to reconnect don't worry just wait 67% of their users returned now this is like an amazing thing like by providing a game and a distraction technique for your users they're able to maintain engagement so in summary what you want to do is reframe the problem and think about user perception keep navigation clear and simple and avoid blank screens and show content as soon as possible so think about Houston Airport think about like what McDonald's did to understand their users pain points think about the navigation and how you can put it front and center and think about always show content and always reassure the users and with that I'd like to say thank you for listening to my talk and always park the plane further away from the terminal building so thank you very much okay thank you so much everyone hope you enjoy the talk take care